uh, County Commissioner Brer Kent, and co-chair of the Resilience Builder, which is part of the Prosperity Partnership that we have going on here. And I do want to acknowledge the Prosperity Partnership. I see Maggie's here. Um, who else from Prosperity is here? Oh, and Luciana. Ah, yeah, they've done a great job. What, what we've done in the county is uh, di divide things by pillars, 11 pillars. We've got a bunch of co-chairs. Jennifer Corrado is one of our co-chairs. Dan Lindblade is as well. And it's been a great way to kind of uh, divide up the work, so to speak. And, and that's kind of how we're doing that. Um, I want to thank everybody for, for being here. And there been, some people have traveled a long ways. Um, who came from California? Uh, that was, uh, she wins the award for, for, yeah, you guys win the award for uh, for this to, to come here. I really appreciate that. Um, as you all know, this is our, uh, hey, George. Um, as you all know, this is our, uh, we're getting ready to kick off our 14th annual um, summit, our climate change summit with uh, four counties, with uh, Palm Beach, Broward, Dade, and, and Monroe. And it's a, it's a big deal. We're about to have a launch today. And the next two days, we're going to be hearing from uh, a lot of people on a lot of things. And I know a lot of people here are part of that. Um, today, we have, we have a, uh, an outstanding person that we're up with uh, Mr. Daniel Stander, who is here from England. He is special advisor to the United Nations. Uh, and I met, I met Daniel what, five years ago at a resilience conference in um, Miami. And I don't think I've ever learned so much in just a, a couple of days from, from having a chance to, to uh, just talk with him. You, I think you're the only Englishman I know that doesn't drink beer, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this, when, we, when, this, when the summit first started, it was largely public sector. And it was, it, it was things that, we, that you know, um, things were kind of all, it was almost like a small community. But over the last five years, what you've started to see is the private sector be a big part of this. And it has really expanded the way we're looking at climate change, resilience, and all those kind of things. I will tell you, we had something just the other night. We had a resilience pitch night. It was like a shark tank, where we had invited the uh, private sector to bring their best <laughs> ideas on a chart on uh, to the to our innovation center over at Nova. And wow, what a what a what a refre refreshing change to start to hear how you know we're always trying to figure out how to tackle all these different things. How are we going to do seawalls and all this stuff? But what you had is you had the private sector saying, oh, we can make those seawalls out of this kind of plastic and this kind of things, and we can make the, they were, I think they were making big glass uh, that was flood proof and bulletproof out of recycled glass. And it was like, here's a lot of good answers that we had not been, that we're, 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 we weren't privy to until you, know, until you kind of get out of your bubble. So I'm glad that we're out of our bubble. Daniel's going to help us. Uh, stay out of that bubble. Um, so uh, we're, today we're it's a, a small conversation, and many of you are on lots of different levels, from elected officials to uh, private sector to, to all, all of us. And you're going to have. And what I, what I think we're hoping will happen today is that this is an opportunity to ask, talk with Daniel, and I know we have a couple of other people with Daniel, and I'll introduce them in a second, or I might have you introduce them. Um, but it's not often we get a chance to talk with someone who's had the kind of experience that Daniel's had on an international level. Someone who's had the chance to look at it. Uh, he was with uh, Risk Management Solutions for years and years. And for those who don't know, it is the preeminent insurance company in the world that looks at risk and looks at how to deal with it and looks at vulnerabilities and and all those kind of things. And most of us don't, they, they know the risk better than all of us, because they're going to have to pay for it if there's a problem. And so they look at it, and they, they, look, they go down, and they, they get down as far down to the zip code. And I was amazed at, you know, one, the costs, and, and all the kind of things that go with that, from reinsurance to all kinds of things. So today we're going to have a chance to your, whatever questions you have, today's the day to ask it. Uh, and and that will, we'll, you know, hopefully we have enough time to get around whatever questions you have. 
Uh, it's going to be a free-flowing conversation. And with that, Daniel, I, I'm going I'm to ask if you don't mind introducing your your guests as well. Okay, is that okay? Of course, because because you know them better. Thank you very much for having me. I um, to preach at some level. I've got nothing to say. I want to hear what's on top of mind for you, and we can have a dialogue. Um, I do just want to say one thing, which is I've been in this room maybe ten minutes. Three people have come up to me and said, "You were I'm one scared. of them. You were one of them. Whatever you do, don't scare us like you did last time." <laughs> apparently, I um, you're another one, James. Is uh, they really enjoyed meeting me, but it was I don't know what I said, but apparently it was really scary. Um, so I'll try and make sure here. Yeah, it's nice to see. You. Make sure it's not too scary. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to briefly introduce Paula, and I'll briefly introduce Muntara as well. Here's what I'm going to suggest: is that we go around the room really quickly with just name, affiliation, and in ten words or fewer, what you want to get out of the next hour, and then let's have a conversation. Does that sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you heard about me. Uh, Paola is a dear, dear friend. I'm so pleased that she's sitting next to me in the flesh because it's the first time we've been alongside each other for Three, four years. Four years. Um, Paola and I first started working many years ago when she was at Swiss Re, which is, depending on which year it is, either the largest or the second largest reinsurer in the world. Um, and she has committed her career to what I would describe as the societal resilience in the face of climate. Um, and she's super committed to that. Um, and she currently leads the North America, or even the Americas, the Americas, North America and South America, for a firm called uh, Willis Towers Watson, which is an insurance broker, but is also a, a, a consulting firm. A human capital uh, consulting firm, as well as asset management. Would you yeah. like to say I took over. Well, well, Sorry. You, like, you, like, you, no, no, you continue. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to introduce Nutara or Absolutely. Go for it. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for having us assess the impact of climate risks and the different future climate scenarios, and therefore, with that, help inform the development of strategies around climate resilience, not in 2100, but next year. So, very much looking forward to this conversation. And I am so pleased to also introduce my colleague, Nguyen Taraki, who joined our team actually about two, three months ago now, joining from Office of Policy and Research in the administration of Governor Newsom. Um, so, a lot of experience that she is bringing from working on policy and resilience development in California. Over to you. Well, this, is, this is the moment where I get to interrupt again, because I first came across the Mintara, you probably didn't know this, moment, but she was uh, um, developing the state's first integrated climate adaptation and resilience plan. Um, so, um, a very good pedigree. I'm going to suggest, can we, just, can we just quickly go around, otherwise the introductions are going to take forever. So, Ron, and then so on, name, affiliation, and ten words or less what you want to get out of the conversation, please. Yes, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Moffat. I'm the Executive Vice President of Career Source Broward. Interested in the conversation from a workforce development perspective, how we can become more agile, more adaptable, and uh, help businesses maintain their competitive position, uh, and just overall improve the quality of life here in Broward College, uh, Broward County, as we go through these changes. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nadia here. Um, at the capacity of a board member for Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, but I'm also in the private sector. I am a mortgage broker, so I do want to understand housing mm -hmm. and what those effects will have on us in the near future. So, thank you so much. Good afternoon. No, yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Romy Suarez, CEO, Executive Director of the Greater Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. And I'm really interested in this afternoon's conversation for the business resiliency and perspective. So, thank you. Hello. Okay, I think that's on. 
new entire key. I've had an introduction, so I'm just going to say hello, and um, it's a pleasure to be here, and really wonderful um, opportunity to join the conversation. So very excited to think about how we build capacity within the public sector, but also really facilitate scaling public and private partnership to meet the urgency and, and scale of need that is um, of action that's needed to address climate. Good afternoon, my name is AJ Ryan, I'm the mayor of Dania Beach. Uh, we are a coastal city, so this is very important to me and my uh, residents of Dania Beach, and also in the private sector, I'm a real estate and a 220 insurance uh, uh, broker. So uh, this has a big impact on me personally and on my city and professionally, so uh, it's, it's very important. And you know, people ask me as a realtor about the housing crisis, and I say the housing crisis is it could start from a major hurricane coming through and destroying our whole insurance business, and it's it's a concern. It's at the front. It's at the front door. So I'm on the front lines as being an insurance salesman, you know, independent insurance agent, and I, I see it happen every day. And uh, as a mayor of a city, a coastal city, we see the climate uh, changes as well and the impacts on our community and our environment. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Drew. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. And my question would be, how can the business community really make an impact and, and resilience, and what, we, what can we do? Good afternoon. Jessica Beach. I'm the City of St. Augustine's Chief Resilience Officer, and I come from the engineering background, so we are focused on technical, but I'm really interested to hear how our partners to the south are tackling this. And so I'm here to listen and learn. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm George Platt. Uh, I'm a partner with LSN Partners where I do public affairs, focus a lot on environment and infrastructure. I'm also co-chair of the uh, Transportation Committee for the Broward Workshop. I sit on the Board of Governors for the Center for Innovation, the NSU Center for Innovation. And, um, and I'm a principal of a company called uh, the Wetlands Bank Company, which does uh, sort of like carbon sequestration credit, but we do it with wetlands credits and with uh, with uh, habitat conservation credits, and we've done that. We're the pioneer in that industry nationally, and uh, and have done it in seven different states. So uh, my uh, concern that I uh, have continually had is that uh, government alone is not acting at a pace that I think needs to uh, happen in order to really address the issues and the question is how do we collectively collaborate uh, uh, the nonprofits, the for-profits, the private sector uh, and government in order to build a better mousetrap in terms of addressing climate change and um, I'm sure we'll hear a lot of ideas about that and I've got some as well. Thank you. Gunther with the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Um, I'm interested to know how this will affect us in economic development moving forward, but also the, the business opportunities uh, to deal with climate change and resilience. I'm Alec Bogdanoff, uh, Principal of Brazaga. Um, I'm a board member of the Chamber and a myriad of other affiliations that will take too long to list on resilience. Um, Really, I'm a connector. My background's in science policy um, and science communications and really figuring out how we can best connect government and the private sector to solve these challenges. Afternoon, everyone. Joe Cox. I'm the uh, president and CEO of the Museum of Discovery and Science right across the street where we're creating a hub for resilience education, which is really dedicated to showcasing innovations and providing some optimism and so really excited to hear what those optimistic answers are and being able to share them with the next generation because the responsibility isn't just on them it's on us thanks joe james donnelly a ceo of the castle group and i'm going to moderate the mayor's panel on friday afternoon at the summit uh, so really my interest today, uh, Daniel, is the, the role of business, similar to some prior uh, speakers. We also manage 400 communities in Florida, and, and I'm very interested in both the role of those communities and the risk, and how we mitigate the risk both to business and to, to the communities. Thank you. 
Hi, Jennifer Harada, Chief Resilience Officer for Broward County. I'm here to serve as the warden and remember everybody to keep your responses to 10 words or less so we get around the circle. <laughs> Good afternoon, Karine Boutros. I'm the Executive Director of the Broward Workshop. Uh, I say ditto to everybody's comments, and I'll keep it at that. Good afternoon, Carol Henderson. I'm Deputy Executive Director of Intergovernmental and Outreach for the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization. I think that was my 10 words. But, uh, <laughs> I'm here to bring back some great ideas. We have a resiliency committee, and I'm sure I can. Uh, there will be some great takeaways. Good afternoon, my name is Isabel Cosillo Carvalho. I'm the Executive Director of the South Florida Regional Planning Council, representing Monroe, Miami, and Broward Counties. And I have worked with a board of elected officials and appointed officials, and I'm interested in learning about best practices that we can share with our local governments and other regional stakeholders. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Ruiz. I'm Assistant County Administrator here with Broward County, and my goal is to learn enough over the next couple of days so that when Dr. Gerardo sits and briefs me on something, I actually <laughs> understand what she's saying. <laughs> uh, I'm John Hayden, city manager for the city of St. Augustine, and uh, Wikipedia lists the city of St. Augustine as four feet below Miami Beach, so that kind of sets the stage for our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Tim Murley. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for Miami-Dade County. For those of you who don't know, it's the foreign country directly to the south. <laughs> and I'm here. I only do what Jennifer Gerardo tells me to do, so I'm done. <laughs> My mayor will join us later this evening, and she has four E's that she drives our entire administration on. Uh, equity, uh, engagement, economy, and environment. And those are the things we want to infuse into the work that we do in climate change. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Max Serta. I'm the town manager for Hillsborough Beach, a very small coastal island um, just in Broward County. And so obviously what I'm looking for is what I can do in the short term and long term to make positive effect for my residents, particularly as they've seen their beach dunes and other infrastructure start to erode away in the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Lockhart. I'm chairman of the Seattle County Commission. Um, I-4 corridor just north of Orlando, just inside New Smyrna Beach. Everybody says, where is Seminole County? That's kind of where we are. Uh, also, honored to serve as the chairman of the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council and a uh, member of the Board of Trustees at Seminole State College, which is one of our 37 state colleges in the state. Um, would love to see how we can get our younger folks so we can grow our own resiliency officers. Um, you all are hard to find. And, um, and also, plug, um, we are looking for a new county manager in Seminole County, so if anyone is looking um, and would like to join a fabulous community, come talk to me. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Veronica Edwards Phillips, the newly elected by my peers mayor of the great VCARE city of Lauderdale Lakes two weeks into the job. So when I received the invitation to attend, here I am. So I am here also to listen and to learn. In the interest of time. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Cole, president of AMBA Communications. Um, I'm a business owner here, and I'm aware of many of the challenges that we have, but I'm hoping today that some of the ideas that we talk about, uh, that we think about how we can create more awareness and engagement with the rest of the community so that they change uh, some of the habits they have, and at the end of the day, we're going to make sure that it's not our kids that are going to be Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Weiss. I'm Palm Beach County Commissioner and currently serving as mayor for the county. I also uh, serve on the Resilience, Environment, and Water uh, Committees for the Florida Association of County and National Association of Counties. Uh, my interest uh, out of this session today is to learn how we might be able to increase public engagement to address uh, climate change, the implications, and mitigations. Good afternoon, Sandy McDonald. I'm the director of the Office of Economic and Small Business Development for Broward County, interested on the economic development side relevant to business, small business, the impact, as well as the opportunities uh, that we'll be facing. 
Good afternoon, Craig Cates, uh, Mayor of Monroe County uh, from Key West, and we're a chain of uh, islands surrounded by water, so we've been uh, dealing with this for many years, and I'm here to hear some of the new ideas and, and maybe learn something that we can apply. Thank you. Ida Lee, Travel Host Media, and um, on multiple committees, but Daniel, I do want to get scared, because when you spoke last time, you woke up the business community. So I want to make sure that what solutions we're coming up with actually work in your world. Rick Darrow, Gulf Building, representing the Briar Workshop. And I'm here to learn what are the best practices for funding the infrastructure yeah. improvements that we know are coming. <clears throat> yeah. Good afternoon, Rob Cornier. It's uh, Community Resiliency for Briar Workshop, Advanced Roofing, Advanced Green Technology, large commercial solar contractor in the state. My question is, how bad is it going to be on the reinsurance uh, after the two hurricanes? And and we've proven that the proper engineering for solar and roofing works. We have two large solar projects in Cape Coral go through undamaged. And the, I call it the factory mutual model. When they send in engineers into buildings and be able to enhance it for wind and, and other things. So what, what can be done with that? George Tablack, uh, Broward County Chief Financial Officer. I get the pleasure of learning how to market debt uh, and answer the questions within the market, the new risks that are being identified, and make sure that we are in tune with answering those questions and selling our debt at the most affordable rates that we can. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I'm Rex Harden, Mayor of the great city of Pompano Beach, and obviously from the name you can tell we are a beachside community just to the north of here, and uh, I'm here to, like like Ina said, I get a little scared. It's, it's, it's important, I think, that we figure out how to make sure that the public stays engaged in this, in this, this topic long enough to force people like me to do something on this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Janelle Kelman. I'm the mayor of Sausalito, California. Thank you all for allowing me to join your conversation here on the other side of the country. Huge thank you to Dr. Morado for uh, letting me know about this and inviting me. Um, I am an environmental lawyer turned entrepreneur turned uh, local elected as well as I head of an NGO called the Center for Sea Rise Solutions. And I am specifically interested in learning from my other electeds what is keeping you from taking action on resilience? What are the roadblocks? Is it political will, political capacity, or a way to fund it? Uh, I'm also interested in the new blue economy and opportunities for innovation to spur our, our uh, economic uh, resilience as well as our climate resilience. Thank you for having me. I wrote Assistant County Administrator of Palm Beach County, and I said most interested in learning uh, tactics on how we translate the challenges we face for our policymakers and for our residents. Resilience Director from Palm Beach County, and I'm most interested in resilience investments in affordable housing, particularly rental housing, so our businesses can retain talent. Daniel, you want to ask answer them all at one all at once? <laughs> or? I was going to let Virginia. Oh yes, introduce herself. <laughs> I'm Virginia Baker. I'm Palm Beach County County Administrator, and I'm quite sure you all have hit on uh, all the topics I was brought up. Sorry about having to step out. But housing is definitely it, uh, one in our infrastructure as we build and rebuild back uh, our infrastructure. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Commissioner. For, there's so much there, isn't there? Um, and, and it's all connected. Um, I, I, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Um, I'll do a little bit of scaring because you asked me to. Um, and then I'll do a little bit of reflecting on where I think you are now relative to where you were five years ago. Um, and then I, we, then let's just pick up on topics, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's talent, or, um, you know, whether it's um, you know, how we innovate, whether it's how we engage the business community. And let's just try and keep it as snappy and as live as possible and um, empower Lerner and Tara and others. Just, just jump in. So. Uh, the, the scary bit, I thought I would, I, I, I was thinking to myself, you guys are so immersed in your local communities, in the Southeast Florida community, with one notable exception, um, and, and I have the benefit of um, playing in a global sandpit, and I just thought I'd share what came out of COP um, 
in Sharm El Sheikh a few weeks ago, so I don't know if you know what COP is, so the, the Convention of the Parties, which is the annual meeting of heads of states of all the countries of the world. Um, it's facilitated by the United Nations, although the UN is not a negotiating party. Um, and I have, for quite some time, been trying to shift the agenda at COP. COP was created initially as a place for intergovernmental negotiations around commitments to reduce greenhouse gases, fundamentally. And that negotiation is an important negotiation and continues apace. Um, but, and this is the scary bit, we know that there's enough energy, or indeed too much energy, in the atmosphere already that even if we reduce um, to net zero immediately, we're going to have to adapt um, to, a, um, to, to that energy and to a world that will be different. And what I have been trying to do, and I think has been increasingly successful, is to get the adaptation agenda um, on par with the mitigation. When I say mitigation, I don't mean in the, in the engineering sense of the word, but in the greenhouse gas reduction sense of the word. And, and that's finally beginning to take shape. Um, and one of the big themes that, that we, uh, we've had at COP over the years was the race to net zero, a big campaign around how we reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. But now we're seeing alongside that what's being termed the race to resilience, which is essentially um, making sure that we have um, prepared and adapted communities um, irrespective of how quickly we get to net zero. because. Believe me, we need to. Now, the other thing that was coming out very, very strongly from COP um, was actually two things I'm going to mention. One is the increased engagement of the business community. Because again, if you think about what COP was, it was a convention of heads of states of national governments. A bit, Commissioner Fur, like, if I may say, the compact was initially uh, electeds and non-electeds from local government coming together. Um, I'm really pleased to see that the business community is stepping in um, at scale internationally and I've been seeing it here over the last few years. The final thing that came out, and I think it was one of your mayor's um, E's, Mayor Daniela's E's, was equity. In fact, I think it was the first of her E's. That is extremely um, top of mind and probably one of the main takeaways from this year's COP, the whole um, discussion of what gets termed loss and damages, which is essentially, this is not how it's described, but whose fault is it, who's to blame, who's to pay, and how do we redress? Um, and fundamentally, those that are most affected by climate change globally are those who are least able to pay, and typically those who have contributed least to the situation. So they were some of the things coming out. And now if I reflect on where this community has come um, in the last few years, I think maybe the scary things I was talking about um, were was the fact that Despite all the work that the community was doing, often very technical work, thinking about hazard, thinking about sea level rise, um, it wasn't being translated into a dialogue that bit with the, uh, with the consumer um, or bit with the, uh, with the business community because it didn't translate that hazard into economics, into what would hit people's pockets or hit businesses' pockets. Um, and I mean, the other angle to that is it kind of doesn't matter um, if you talk about sea level rise and, it, and, in, if you, and if you talk about it in language that the markets don't understand or isn't the language that the markets are using, then you could probably talk until you're blue in the face and they're still not going to reward you for your efforts. So you need to learn the language of business both to engage the communities um, and the business community, because we need a whole of um, society solution, but also to be able to speak the language of the market. So whatever great work you are doing around adaptation is rewarded by the markets um, because they can understand it. Um, and I've seen this community go on that journey over the last five years, and you could even argue that um, uh, convenings like this where we have public and private uh, around the table together is testament to that fact. Um, so I'm, 
enthused by what I've seen. Equally, we've still got so much further to go. Um, and I see this as an opportunity. It's come up in a few places. Uh, you know, Joe, I think you mentioned it particularly, um, or it, it struck when you talked about it, but also, um, you know, Jessica and others. Um, this is an opportunity to attract talent, to develop capacity, to develop innovations, and to make Southeast Florida not ground zero for climate risk, um, but a hub of climate adaptation innovation. Um, and I think we're beginning to see, especially with some of the questions um, where people want to know, what are those new things? How do we attract that talent? Because unfortunately, and George, you and I had a conversation with this uh, about this the other day, um, it's hard to attract talent to this part of the world given what we're seeing in insurance rates, given how those rates are going to make um, affordable housing possibly a thing of the past, um, we need to find other ways to make this a center of innovation. And I think, you know, if the billionaires of the 90s and the noughties were the tech billionaires, the billionaires of this decade and the next decade will be the climate adaptation innovation um, uh, uh, in innovators. Um, and so the question is, you know, again, with respect to the, to, um, to the Bay Area, um, if Silicon Valley was the place where um, uh, that innovation took hold in technology for the last couple of decades, can this be the place where we see that kind of innovation and then preserve the, uh, the, the future, economic future of the region? Um, I'm going to pause because there's lots of what we could dig into. I can see Beams reaching for with, with his finger. Just, I, I wanted to start to open up. Go on. So, anybody, if you have a jump right in, feel free. Can I? I just wanted to uh, tell a very quick story, which is five years ago, um, uh, rep then Representative Kristen Jacobs and I had a conversation because I Lee challenged Jennifer and I to do, do just that, to communicate to the business community. And we invited you uh, down. Uh, you graciously came, and we had a roundtable with business leaders in Broward County. And from that, we actually did the business case analysis for Southeast Florida. And we showed that it's cost beneficial for us to adapt anywhere between 2 to 1 to 10 to 1, depending on where you are in our community. And so, you know, we've come a long way in the past five years, and a lot of lines actually draw back to that first conversation we had with you five years ago. And so I, I wanted to thank you, but I'll just also underscore that. You know, this has been a commitment for a long time, and it's something that's going to take decades to do, but we've, we've set the foundation and we've started those conversations. Feel free to jump in. I, I just got back um, from Belgium. My son lives there, and we spent a week, and, and I was struck by the cultural differences where everyone rode a bike and all your trash was put in the right bag at the end of your driveway and if you left your lights on when you left your house all your neighbors would look stare at you until you went back and shut them <laughs> off that's a cultural change but it seems to me if we can build resiliency but there's still a cause and and until we change the culture of this country you know we're just going to be this uphill battle so i i just want to throw up in the mix how we affect that that's a big thing in america like we're just stuck on waste and spend so it just struck me that the culture was so different and i asked myself how could we get that culture here i won't put that in the mix i'm, I'm only going to respond with a little quick which is i'm pleased george walked here today <laughs> I, I saw him yesterday he said uh, he said well, what's the parking like <laughs> Maybe I, I thought building on that is something that we noticed at the past COP is how even as Daniel was saying that it's a convening of the public sector, the private sector took a step forward and actually started shifting the agenda at COP last year in Scotland. And I think there's quite a bit to be said about consumer behavior. Um, so if we try to enforce change via policy, that's one way, which may work in some parts of the world, world better than others, but when we choose as consumers, 
then we are enacting change. And there's a lot that was mentioned today about understanding how to engage with the community. And actually, in many conversations that we have, not only with the public sector, but also with the private sector, there's decision makers at the head of the big companies that are disclosing their um, understanding of the risks impacting their businesses, but also disclosing their strategies about how they're going to address those risks and turn them into opportunities so they can continue existing and, if possibly, growing. And a lot of that has to do with engagement. It's engagement with the consumer. ...really come to market this year. So the Belize deal was first quarter, September, that was it? Uh. No, it was, no, earlier. It was no. earlier than that. Yeah, it was. It was actually last quarter, last uh, last year. last year by the prior cup. Yeah, so it's a natural catastrophe wrapper around the foreign debt of Belize, and in talking about accessing uh, capital, accessing debt uh, by having that insurance, a parametric insurance protection around uh, the repayment of the debt in face of hurricanes it allowed the government of Belize to access better capital terms in the international market, a combination of uh, multilateral and private sector capital. Janelle, so, oh, sorry. No. Janelle, did you have a question? Thank you, Daniel, for that. It's all very intellectually interesting. Um, I'm wondering if and we might be able not confusing. <clears throat> to, to bring, it, bring it to the pragmatic implementation side of things. Please. So we all know with spaghetti maps, there's no way to tell where the next big catastrophic hurricane is going to land. And the major risk on topic of equity is that, we, that the uninsured flood risk uh, opportunity is increasing, right? And that's for a couple reasons. One is that the FEMA flood risk maps are actually antiquated. And the second is we're not, we don't have adequate data to conduct risk assessments, right? And so ultimately, what we do is we have uninsured folks who are suffering the most. That's a massive equity issue. We also have maladaptation for those who do have flood insurance that just come back and build where they were before, right? Low-hanging fruit, don't let that happen. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. on some of the uh, evolving products, for example, um, parametric insurance, uh, the manner in which insurance is uh, partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers for nature-based solutions. Um, also, uh, community-type insurance, community pools. So how can we bring some of this long-term debt, bond obligation, international mm -hmm. macroeconomic trends to home so that we can have better insurance products that actually fix both catastrophic risk as well as long-term, long slow-moving incremental change like sea level rise? Sure. Can we take some of the... Th Go ahead. Any I, I don't think. Could I? I'm sorry, Amy Lockhart from Seminole County. I love what you just said because you're speaking to my community right now. Um, we have almost 300,000 homes that are now uninhabitable in Seminole County because of the flooding from Hurricane Ian. The majority of those homes were not in FEMA flood maps. So the majority of those homes did not have flood insurance. Um, those who were in flood zones didn't flood. They had the flood insurance. So the people who had the flood insurance said, why in the world have I been paying for it? My house didn't flood. They're not complaining, but still questioning. And the folks who didn't have it are absolutely devastated because $37,000 from FEMA does not rebuild a $400,000 home. So we need to figure out from a local perspective, practically, how do we communicate with the families who are the ones who are actually now, I've got kids that I can't figure out what schools they're going to go to because we have no rentals mm -hmm. <laughs> to put these families in in our community and they've been displaced. So it's, it, is, it is here and it's there, and it's it's now. Where do I move my family to? And um, and so I love that conversation, and I would love to figure out how to practically help local communities prevent something like that from happening again, and at the same time uh, help us in in the current situation that we're in, in in the in the middle of the crisis. Uh, I'm I'm going to jump in, if that's okay, but keep throwing stuff out. Um, I want to say thank you. Don't get me started on NFIP, right? And don't get me started on FEMA flood maps because, uh, you know, you wanted it to be practical. I could get really wonky on that kind of stuff. And it, it's a bit of a hobby horse. And I think that's probably the kind of things that I was saying about five years ago. Um, this is really tricky. Um, at some level, thankfully, um, the federal government... Um, initiated about five years ago a program it's called Risk Rating 2.0. I don't know whether anyone's familiar with it, but it's fundamentally um, NFIPs move away from 
antiquated ways of measuring risk to something that is more sophisticated and properly quantifies the risk. This is a good thing. However, um, it receives considerable political um, backlash um, because, understandably, it means that people will end up paying more, especially those in high hazard flood zones. I don't have a very good answer because, and maybe this was the scary stuff that I said five years ago, because the answer really is there's a bit of a bitter pill that needs to be swallowed. And that bitter pill is to accept that the risk is at the level that it is. And that will mean for your constituents, unfortunately, things will cost more and may not be affordable. Um, and I can't remember, I think, I, I think it was Corrine said, don't leave us with that kind of message because, you know, that's too scary that things are just going to get worse. Well, if you're swallowing the bitter pill, you need to come straight back with the, the medicine that's going to correct it st still further. And that is, I think, the adaptive um, uh, solutions. But it could also be, seeing as, uh, Janelle, you mentioned it, um, is, is community and neighbourhood-based insurance pooling. Um, I don't know whether you're in the know, and maybe you were, I'm not sure, but there's something that is afoot in New York at the moment, um, which is along those lines with a number of neighbourhoods, which are neighbourhoods that are quite disadvantaged, to try and create um, a private market solution um, for flood insurance. Um, so I think that maybe there's an answer um, that you that is embrace the changes that are coming from the federal government rather than resist them. Embrace the fact that risk needs to be priced correctly, otherwise you're just kicking the can down the road. But make sure you have solutions up your sleeve that are both adaptive and because you can't adapt away all of the risk. There will be residual risk and it will be expensive. So find solutions that could be, someone said it earlier, that, that resilience is hyperlocal. Find some local community-based solutions, some risk pooling solutions that fill in the gaps around that residual risk. That's quite a complicated undertaking, and I'm sorry because that sounded maybe a bit too intellectual, but I think that is where the answer, you know, where, where we need to get to. I would love to see NFIP go out of business, by which I mean I would love there to be a private market solution to this problem. Not because I'm an insurer and I'm going to make money off it, but because that's where it should sit. This risk should sit on the balance sheets of entities that are better capitalised to take that risk, manage that risk, and understand it. Um, and I'm sure that when uh, NFIP was created, what, 60, 70 years ago, nobody thought it would still be here today. Um, I'd love to find a way to engineer it out of existence because risk was being appropriately managed rather than having these repeating cycles. But I see Nointara was waving at me. Great. Is this on? OK. Yeah, so you touched on um, a couple things that I was going to mention, and also in, in response to the question um, that you had around kind of what is the most important thing that we should be really thinking about. And I, I would hazard to say maybe it's not the most, but it is one of the most important things, which is understanding climate as a material financial risk to government and to business, and then incorporating climate into all our investment decisions and not thinking of climate as, and you know, speaking from personal experience in California, we spent a lot of time working with our Department of Finance, working with our state agency partners to say, we have to stop thinking of climate as a pot of money over here, as an issue over here that gets added as an overlay to other investments or as a standalone, but rather as material to all our investments. Because housing is a climate strategy, transportation is a climate strategy, workforce development is a climate strategy. And we are, as a public sector, as a state, we're making investments every single day, significant investments. And if we aren't aligning those investments with the laws that are on the books around climate and our priorities and goals, we are missing 
the majority of our opportunity to actually drive the change at scale that we need. And so, you know, in California, we have a cap and trade program. We are very lucky to have these dedicated pots of funding. And I'm not saying we don't need dedicated pots of funding with specific focus to drive on priorities and really target investments where they need to go. But we have to get beyond this idea as climate as a standalone budget item and rather understand it as a material risk, both on the balance sheet, but also as an opportunity for investment and economic growth. And to the point on the flood insurance program, I'm gonna move away from flood and just for a minute talk about wildfire. So sorry, I know that's <laughs> a very, okay, okay, California focus. But this is a major issue that we have in California, which is come to the fore, which is we have to start pricing the real risks into housing, into insurance, into how and where we grow and develop, and we're not doing that adequately. But from a public perspective, public policy and, and government perspective, mm -hmm. one of the things we really grappled with, so we don't have all the answers, and I'm really excited to learn here over these next few days from you all, we have to complement the pricing in the market with social and public services, because if we price it overnight, we are gonna leave communities that are already struggling and already behind further out. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think about on-ramps for pricing mm -hmm. in, but then also policy and support structures that provide the support so you don't have fixed income communities who are locked in to housing that they can't sell because they can't get insurance. And then the cascading implications that it has for local governments and local revenue generation, et cetera. So um, I know there's a number of different things, but really um, excited to build on many well, of the points. I just want to say I really like that because it's, it, you need the solutions and the on-ramp. So you, you need to swallow the bitter pill, but maybe you don't want to swallow it all at once, right? Because it will be shocking um, and it could mean the end of some communities. So you need to drip feed that in and you need to have um and that should buy you the time to um to, to embrace those uh, adaptive uh, measures but i think there's one other point there um, which is around community engagement because none of this works unless you sell it to the public um, and when i say sell it i mean sell it um, you're going to have to bring them along with you um other and and that's a dialogue over time as well um, i see a few waves Excuse me. Yeah, I want to, if, if you don't mind, uh, add a. Okay, well, I give up. I, I mean, I, I really like what 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 you had to say. It, it kind of cuts to the quick, and it cuts across so many different areas. But two things happen in this country. We've got this mantra about "Don't tread on me," you know, uh, um, and uh, take away my rights. And then we've got the cost-benefit analysis that goes into everything that we do. But there are many things that we do that. Commuter rail is a good example. Recycling, you know, we ought to be recycling whether it makes money or not, right, Beam? Uh, uh, and and so, um, kind of figuring out a way to do this. I, I think back to the Clean Water Act. Now, the Clean Water Act was, uh, if you remember, the first George Bush uh, came down with his policy of no net loss of wetlands functions and values. Um, uh, this is something that has been bipartisan over the years. And so it meant that whenever you were going to impact a wetland, you basically had to make up for it one way or another. And oftentimes left to states and localities to figure out how to best do that. Uh, it has given, I mentioned earlier, the mitigation banking business, but it's given way to enormous entrepreneurial initiatives, uh, uh, mostly at local and state levels, not so much at the national level. But there are policies at the national level that can help drive this. Most of us is still going to be community-based, and we need to figure out to, uh, to a, a way to, to uh, mitigate the cost-benefit analysis and recognize some things are never going to make money. You're going to subsidize them. You're happy to subsidize them. I mean, uh, we'd be getting vaccines even if you know it, it wasn't a money-making enterprise. So, so I just want to make sure that, and this needs to be inculcated into every policy that we're talking about, whether it's construction, okay, and development, of which there's an enormous amount, both public and private, or whether or not it's a transportation industry or the many other industries. So I just, uh, you know, I just think that sometimes a policy like that at the national level can trigger 
a whole new realm of industries and entrepreneurial efforts, such as has happened in the wetlands conservation and preservation and the habitat conservation areas. The question is how do we kind of take some of those models and adapt them to some of the other infrastructure needs and, and you know, we're not going to get a carbon tax anytime soon, so we've got to look for alternatives uh, that do this. Mayor Weiss? So, yeah, thank you. So I wanted to follow up on one of the things that James said, and, and we just talked about engagement, and that, and it led me to think back on how you change behavior in this country. And seatbelt laws um, and anti-smoking tend to come to top of mind when I try and think of things that have really, where we've shifted the paradigm. And, and But how do we get there with climate? And, you know, and I'm then thinking about what happened on the west coast of Florida with Hurricane Ian. Here was a perfect opportunity to really drive home the points of climate adaptation, um, mitigation, all of it. And unfortunately, that flew out of the news cycle almost immediately, and it was all about the rebuilding and allowing people to rebuild exactly where they were the same way they did it um, because that's what the insurance company said. The insurance company should have, at, at that time, I mean, honestly, there should be, and, and as you said, the bitter pill, um, Daniel, that pill should have been swallowed in those communities because that's the only way we're going, people are going to wake up to understand really what these implications are, to talk about you know, trying to quantify the risk and, 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 and have people pay for it. Well, in some places, the risk is 100%, and, and there are, they should be uninsurable. But unfortunately, we are not there yet, and because the public is not engaged at that level yet. And until that happens, I think we're going to, we've, we've got a long road to hoe. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, what's coming out of, out of this conference um, and the folks, the best minds, it's really got to be about communication yep. um, and education because the way people think about what they do and how they're doing it and what the implications are, need, it has to change before we're going to really have any kind of sustainable long-term impact uh, with the public. And the last thing I'll leave, uh, close with was, you know, an understanding, you know, as now being an elected official, leadership, you can get too far ahead and the public's not behind you. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have to be able to make those incremental steps and how do we get there? And what are those increments that are going to be? So I think those would be great things for us to focus on and be able to create those policies that will bring us incrementally along. So that would be my comments for tonight. I'd Paul, like to respond, wanna... but I know that Rob's got his hand up. So let's hear from Rob first. Is that, is that... Yeah, I think it's going to kind of tie it in. I'm reading your short bio, and it says you're best known for your hashtag resiliency finance using technology and financial product innovation to help capital find reasonable investments in the face of climate and other extremes. Can you give us some examples of that, maybe? For sure. And you still have your college photo on this, too, by the way. <laughs> Rob, how can you go? <laughs> Monica just says she thinks it's rather handsome. I'm not sure whether she's talking about the photo or the one in the flesh. Both, both things. Um, thank you. Can, can I come back to what the um, commissioner was saying um, about in insurance affordability and building back the same versus building back better? Um, and, and Paolo may have something to, to add on this. Um, I agree with what you've said. The reality is there are two reasons, I think, why um, immediately after an event we, re 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 we rebuild or we allow people to rebuild in exactly the same way in exactly the same place. Um, the first is moral hazard associated with an insurance product. If I was going to get a better house somewhere else than... I'd being you know, incentivized to burn my own house down. 
right? So that you only get back what you had before to the state that it was in. And that moral hazard issue is it's not the insurers insisting that you build back in exactly the same place in exactly the same way. It's not that they want you to do that. It's just that's the contract, because if it was a different contract, um, it would introduce some perverse incentives. But there's a human angle, and I think, Amy, you mentioned it when you were talking about the experiences in, in, in Seminole County, which is what does somebody want to do when they've just had uh, experienced a catastrophic event and they've just been made homeless or just been displaced? They want to get back home. They want to get back to normal um, as, as fast as they can. And I think it's those two drivers that get in the way of us building back better and building back differently. Um, there was another point that you made about essentially the, the risk being so high that it may be uninsurable. Um, and I'll, I'll invite Paola maybe to say something on this in a second. Um, what... I'm, I don't work for an insurance company. I'm not a, um, and, and I think insurance has a fantastic role to play in society and, and, and a huge societal benefit, um, but, I, but I'm not an apologist for the insurance industry. But if you think about what the insurance industry wants, what it wants is risk at an appropriate level. It, it doesn't want the absence of risk because then it doesn't have a business. It doesn't want risk to be so high that nobody can afford the insurance. And it's not really that um, there will be properties in locations that are uninsurable because you know go to Lloyd's of London and you'll find somebody who will insure it for you at the right price mm -hmm. when we say uninsurable we mean unaffordable mm -hmm. um, and that's that's really the issue um, and I think George you mentioned it earlier there are things that we do just because we they're the right thing to do your example was recycling we're going to do it irrespective of whether it makes money or not there's a really difficult question around certain communities which is do we continue to subsidize them even though they're economically not viable now I'm not sure I'm in a position to judge that but as an elected official or as community members, we have to make those really, really tough decisions. Is that something we're going to do and we have to do and it behooves us to do that because we look after our fellow humans in those communities? Or do we at some point say no? Um, we can't afford to do that and that's not the right thing for us to do and we therefore need to find alternative solutions to where these people are going to live. Did you want to say yes. something similar? Kind of. Could I build on it? Please. So... Uh, going back to Ina's point about what the action, right, from the macro level, my response to that would be plan ahead and invest. Of course, in order to invest, we want to be able to access capital in the right terms. And from there, we started talking about insurance before. So I wanted to bring into the example of insurance accessibility and affordability the work that we're doing on wildfire in California, together with the Nature Conservancy. We did a study, a study with us um, where we developed a methodology to assess the current value of the savings that a community would have in the future by investing today in community. So how do those savings translate into reduction of insurance premium? At this point, we were able, at this point in time, we were able to put a number in terms of insurance premium reductions. The question is going to be, back to your point, there's soft and hard markets, but insurance will typically have capital to put where the risk is well priced technically, meaning there are communities that are highly exposed and therefore if they want to access insurance, the cost may be just inaccessible. And that's where we say insurance is pulling out of the market. It happened, we were working with Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Some insurers had to pull out. Other insurers were offering insurance at such a high price ticket that it was unaffordable. We're observing something similar in, in California as out of that report. Now we're working with communities that have done amazing investments in resilience against wildfire. They are standing out in comparison to the neighboring communities because their losses would be substantially lower. Now we're trying to find the right capital to back up that insurance program. And it's a matter of making the case of investment and proving to the insurance community that there are communities that are indeed 
reducing their future risk. It still needs investment for adaptation, but reducing the insurance risk to demonstrate that there's a market. And I wanted to, with that I wanted to encourage those conversations about reinsurance because I've been doing insurance innovation for a very long time time, I'm not going to say my age, but I've been working on insurance for vulnerable populations around the world for a long time. And often I've been faced with that message. There's no reinsurance. There is reinsurance. There's always reinsurance. But what's the right price? And that then what do you bring within the package to negotiate with the reinsurance sector to say, well, I'm the one investing in resilience. You still want to work in this market? This is what we're doing. Now let's work together. And that's where we structure products from community insurance to all the way to the cat wrapper for Belize. We're going to find a solution. We need to place it right. Um, one last comment, which is connecting then to rebuilding. I agree with the tough situation of having to engage with the community and sometimes rebuilding better even in the right place doesn't make sense. Um, but there's a human capital component in there, uh, which is really difficult to um, engage in the right way because of our emotions as people. Um, there is, in, in the case of how we rebuild and in those situations, I wanted to bring to your awareness the IBHS, which is the Institute for Business and Housing Security. This is an institute that has been created by the insurance sector, but um, Think of it as an independent think tank, an innovation facility that tests construction methods and develops standards for construction. So for example, there's Fortified, which is a whole standard about how to build and rebuild and how to protect homes and businesses in the face of hurricanes. And those buildings that are rebuilt under those standards should have access to better terms in terms of capital and insurance. Should, <laughs> faces, should. But those are standards that whenever we're working with the public sector on resilience, we are bringing those star standards to the conversation because it's the same as the communities investing in wildfire resilience. There's an action, and if we can show that action and the impact, then it should drive the right capital towards it. That's where my part I'm going to jump in one with one more thing. Um, IBHS is great, um, and the person that used to run FEMA, um, uh, Roy Wright, is now their CEO, and um, I'm sure he'd be happy to engage in conversations. Um, great guy. Uh, I wanted to go back to, I think it starts with valuing things correctly. Um, valuing the role of community. One of the other big themes coming out of COP was valuing nature appropriately. It, ha it has a value. It's an asset. Uh, um, I, I happen to have a very brief conversation yesterday with uh, the person at Broward County who's responsible for your parks. But whatever the natural assets are, they are assets on your register and they should be appropriately valued. And there are so many dimensions to the value of nature. Um, and I think they are um, once we properly quantify the value of things like community or things like nature, mm -hmm. then it can be easier to, um, A, build a business case around protecting them, um, and B, attracting others to invest in maintaining them, uh, help you maintain them, because they see the, the social and full value of it. Um, I'll leave it there for now. AJ. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few comments after what I've been listening to, and uh, I am one of those youth, uh, believe it or not, that you're talking about getting the, the word to. I'm 33 years old. <clears throat> In um, undergrad, uh, I studied at USF. I studied uh, Thomas Friedman, hot, flat, and crowded, so uh, very familiar with that, and that was like 13, 14 years ago, and what he talked about uh, then about business in the private sector getting involved, it's all come to fruition. And, uh, you know, it's incredible to see it. I know he's probably written like four books since then. Um, so uh, we talked about local efforts, right, uh, to, to do things on a local level. So I could give you an example. Local, local efforts can be blocked uh, by red tape, you know, from the county, uh, from, for an example, my, my city, 
we, we wanted to put in um, artificial reefs, right? And so when you, when you talk about waterways, you're dealing at a county level, you're dealing with uh, the state level, the Navy, the Army Corps engineers. So it, it's a lot of red tape that you have to go through, especially when you're dealing with waterways and our reefs. Um, and so we, we were going to put, I think, like 20 new artificial reefs, and we got blocked because we couldn't do it, and the Navy said no. Um, and so just like that, it shows you, you, get, you get blocked when you're trying to put the good foot forward, and it ends up costing our city $10,000, but that's another point. Um, so I believe that incentives for uh, the cities, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good idea, and, or at least recognition for the cities taking a, um, making the right step forward you know, to make progress in this climate, climate issue that we have. And uh, it's good to take preventative measures. And so now, getting on the insurance side, uh, you talk about uh, bitter pill to swallow. Bitter pill to swallow. Uh, the state of Florida is the fraud capital of the nation. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure, right? I don't know. Well, it, 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 we're, we're the fraud capital of the nation. I'm, I'm almost insured, especially in insurance. And the big problem with insurance, we haven't had a major hurricane come through South Florida in probably like 10, 12 years, to be honest with you. It, you know, uh, Irma skimmed by us. It was like 200 miles off coast. Uh, we were fortunate to dodge Ian, but, um, you know, we've, we've dodged it, but our insurance is still raised due to... Uh, false claims, assignment of benefits, you know, uh, unrelated weather damages with water claims, uh, in, in huge litigation costs on both sides. So th that's what's tough with insurance, you know, when, when it talks about uh, how you can minimize and reduce the premium, it's not just based off of climate change. If we just based off that, it would be a lot more simpler. And, you know, six companies, insurance companies, went insolvent before Ian even hit the state of Florida. Uh, so, yes, that's... That, those are basically my comments and uh, just a few questions that I had. Thank you. I, I can see Jim. Bim. Jim. Good. Daniel, um, value in nature. I think one of the things that we should always remind ourselves, as much as our region is a huge urban area, six million people, trillions of dollars of value in real estate, if you actually measure the square miles of our four counties, more of it is in nature. And it is the green infrastructure that is actually the location of the largest ecosystem restoration project in the world. And it has multiple benefits that should, we should find ways to value uh, besides the thing that we value is just the quality that it brings to our lives. But its ability to store fresh water, to uh, keep our drainage system in equilibrium. Um, it's, there isn't another place in the world that I know of that has an urban area like this <laughs> that is sustained by a, a managed natural area. Uh, and you know, last Saturday, they, we celebrated the 75th birthday of Everglades National Park. And of course, a birthday party is a good time for celebration and and, and there is so much that has happened in those 75 years that has actually improved the environment uh, that is basically because there's been an intervention to, you know, to use it and value it. So I, I just think we have that to work from mm -hmm. as an asset uh, to figure out how to use in this equation that we're all trying to figure out how to, how to bring people to the adaptation world. Um, that's a huge part of our uh, community. Thanks. Yeah. I can see Jennifer's. Uh... Good. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, a, a theme that was raised earlier about the workforce development and career pathways and so forth. And I think that that's something that we've been talking about in our region for some time, wanting to become this epicenter of solutions and, and uh, uh, recognizing that you have to have the jobs available and you need to have the trained workforce. And uh, I would like to invite everyone to listen uh, for the conversation with uh, Alex Codd tomorrow on the lessons from abroad. And he's a councilman with the um, city of Hull. And, and it just seems like an extraordinary model where they um, suffered flood impacts. Uh, the community was in this uh, incredible state of disruption. They moved forward with this major flood management program with a huge ROI, uh, which he will talk about, which I thought was really reinforcing of our own 
uh, business case for resilience and the value of investing up front in, in uh, you know, flood mitigation and other adaptation strategies. But more than that, he also talks about their investment in a region in um, clean energy and that they've worked so closely with industry to uh, make sure that fabrication was happening at home and that they weren't having to transport these goods in in order to be able to be celebrators of green technology and that they've worked so closely with the academic uh, partners and that they've just got this mill in which they're pushing out young people who've got jobs waiting for them. And it's just been this huge economic opportunity and uh, I wish we would also have a little bit more time uh, to speak with somebody like that. But, um, you know, I think about our own uh, efforts here in Broward County to develop a very comprehensive uh, resilience plan and, you know, what that's going to take and what kind of funding will be needed and the type of community support that's going to need to be generated. But the jobs and opportunities that will come with having something really big that we can sell that is a quality of life improvement that has those yeah. values of you know long term uh, risk reduction risk reduction and cost savings and i i just i, I i'm concerned when we talk about um, communication strategies how to be effective and you know, you need to be able to sell the story to the financers. You need to be able to sell it to the community. You need to be able to the residents. You need to be able to sell it to our business community partners. And and um, I, I don't know that there's a question in there except that, um, you know, we're really desperate to make sure that the product that we produce is going to meet these objectives. And I just wonder if you have um, thoughts or perspectives because sometimes I feel like these larger initiatives come post-disaster. Mm -hmm. And in our situation, we're going to be trying to get ahead of that. And it's easier to sell a solution when I think a community realizes that they don't want to go through this event again. So do you have any advice along those lines? I'm happy to respond. I can also got an eye on the clock, Commissioner Fair. So you, this may be the last last question, actually. And Let's, I can see Monica wants to contribute as well. Okay. So I, I, yeah. I, I'll just say really briefly, um, I actually think you're in a good position to sell what you're doing. What, what do you need? You're working with, you know, you've been thoughtful. You, you've, you're getting ahead of the problem. You're working with high quality, globally recognized private sector firms that can help um, uh, evidence the value of what it is you're doing. Um, it, it's much better to invest ahead than to try and raise money from a position of distress. Yes, people suffer from disaster amnesia, so they've forgotten that this bad stuff can happen. But thankfully, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, we had something up the west coast of the Panhandle not so long ago, so it's kind of front of mind that you dodged the bullet. So I, I like to think you're going to be successful. Um, I'm, I think it is important that you deliver, a, with your language, a quality work product. It has to be high quality, that it will, it will deliver resilience dividends and that it's well articulated and theoretically proven. The other thing I would maybe consider is try and take it to the bank in advance with an insurance back guarantee, not selling those products, but I think it might be the kind of thing that would give the investor um, the extra push um, to, to, to get over the hump. And yeah, if you wanted to wrap in a, um, um, uh, you know, a cat wrapper on that too, you could consider that. But I, I, I think you're well positioned. Dan, I'm would, would that be you. in, uh, are you... Last time we talked, we, we, we had, you had talked about resilient bonds and things yeah. like that. Would it be in, the, in those kind of vehicles or um, something different? So resilient bond, resilience bonds only tend to work when, you're, when you've got an existing insurance program. Okay. Right? So, if you've, so what I'm talking about is something different. Okay. I'm talking about something that will make a debt bond issuance, if that's the way you're going to finance this, a debt bond issuance more attractive to investors and de-risk it by taking any leap of faith off the table around whether the um, 
perceive the the the, um, the, the um, climate resilience benefits that are being claimed are going to to, to come to fruition. That's different from a resilience bond, which is. Um, if you've got an existing insurance program and you're paying um, premiums already, and maybe Paola referred to this, um, and you put these adaptive measures in place, then you can hopefully um, re see a reduction in those premiums and use some of that reduction in the premiums to finance the adaptive measures. So what I'm referring to is something different. It's around making the debt issuance more attractive um, to more markets. Monica, would you, do you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you. So, and, and my apologies to the group, and thank you for your indulgence to allow me to, to join in. Um, I was um, on another commissioner briefing, and he sends his regards. I'll tell you later who that might be. But, um, um, you know, this is an important, such an important conversation, and, and I wanted to thank, first of all, um, this distinguished group uh, to be here, and Commissioner Fur for your leadership as well. Um, and, and the, um, res, it's resonating what this last part of this discussion is. And, and, and my CFO is sitting over here to my left, uh, George, who continually, well, <laughs> continually tells us uh, that during these um, rating agency conversations, when we're going out for, you name it, airport, seaport, our general obligation bonds, this conversation is at the forefront. And we're seeing the relevance more and more. And so um, they see that we are putting our money where our mouth is mm -hmm. and that we are uh, preparing for those scenarios and, and that we have been a leader. And it's just such um, a refreshing conversation to have so many, uh, not just community leaders, but also our government leaders from around the region here um, with the same interest because we are seeing mm -hmm. that um, and, and our, our ratings keep getting upgraded every time we turn around, knock on wood. Um, and and it, I believe firmly that it has to do with the investments and the way that we carry out the, the work that we do. So thank you for, for that. And hello and thank you again to everyone. It looks like my, my other county administrator to our north wants to say a word, if, if you might. Yes, please. I will be very brief. I 100% agree, Monica beat me to the point on our rating agencies. They are, that is far up front and foremost in their minds, and it has been for a number of years, if not a decade. Uh, and they are interested when they come in and they're looking at your community to rate your bonds, they're looking at your capital program, they're looking at whether you're uh, building back better or even building new, uh, and they, they hold you to that. Uh, and so they're looking at how your reserves are set up so that if you are significantly impacted, whether you've got reserves to, to keep your community afloat for the first week or two uh, before the cavalry comes in to save you. And they are also looking at, uh, as you increase your capital program, you know, what those dollars are going for, roads, mm -hmm. infra you know, just infrastructure overall, resilience and the heartening of your structures, uh, and then also how you're building housing in your community. Mm -hmm. So as we go through our budget process, we're always trying to lay those those things out. As we build budgets, we're looking at in more investment in capital. We're also looking at more investment in our reserves. So it is critical, and it does help a lot with the rating agencies if that is if those actions are being taken. Just a final point, if I may, which is, uh, Nguyen Tara um, rightly advocated for the fact that you know yes you may wish to have a separate climate budget to invest in specific climate issues but it needs to be a cross-cutting theme really what the rating agencies are looking for is a healthy community mm -hmm. a healthy community from a socio-economic perspective and climate affects everything it affects the SME community and um, you know it, it affects it and, and, and can um, exacerbate inequity um, and so try and think of it as in the round think of resilience holistically it's not a um, it's not a single vector of resilience it's not that it's climate 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 of course that's the pressing issue but it's about how it interacts with everything else because climate is an affordable housing issue climate is a transportation issue so climate is a social equity issue um, to tr if, uh, and the and the uh, rating agencies uh, will reward those communities that think about it holistically and the markets will, re will reward those communities too I know we've, we've embedded climate change into our policy. I don't know if we've embedded it mm -hmm. into contracts and things like what you're talking about. That's a very interesting 
different different mindset there. So I appreciate that. This conversation could go on for a long mm -hmm. time, and I know all of us. I wish it could. However, we have to be somewhere else at six o'clock. <laughs> um, so with that, I want to first. I want to just thank everybody for being here for for contributing. This has been a very good conversation. Daniel, Paola, Tara, thank you so much. Can we give them a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this, this kind of gives us some, uh, some uh, it's a good kickoff to our summit. Uh, when we're at some of the panels and things that we're going to be seeing for the next couple of days, this may inform us with some questions and some, uh, some ideas to further uh, the dialogue. So with that, thank you all so much. And uh, I'll see you later.